Okay, thanks. Uh, great. So yeah, so I should warn you all before, I'm a systems grad student, so um, I'm not an expert on machine learning. I'll try to, you know, to make do with, with what I can. Uh, but this is a system that's very applicable to machine learning. Um, so just for some background, the AMP Lab is a, is a lab started at Berkeley uh, about a year ago that's focusing on big data. And uh, Spark is one of the computational frameworks we've built in it to make it easier to do a lot of sophisticated computation on big data. So j just to be clear about this, the environment we're targeting here is large-scale commodity clusters, so either private data centers or the public cloud. And there's been a lot of interest in these as a computing platform, of course, as we all know, uh, to handle the biggest data sets, and tools like MapReduce have been very successful. Um, but things like MapReduce and, and Dryad, even though they are very successful, they have some limitations. They're not great for all types of problems. And it turns out in a lot of problems relevant to machine learning, these tools aren't very efficient. So what's, what's the actual uh, limitation or problem? So a lot of these tools, be they MapReduce or Dryad, are built on essentially the same um, execution model, which is acyclic data flow through a graph of operators. So basically, you, you set up a graph of operators. They could be your map and reduce tasks. And you pass the records through them. You load these records from a stable storage system, like a distributed file system. And you pass them through, and you write them back out. And this is not an accident. By, by adopting the data flow models, these systems can do a lot of things uh, automatically that are very hard to program by hand. So they can decide where to schedule the task based on data locality. They can automatically recover from failures or from slow nodes um, or things like that. And they make it much easier to program these big clusters. But acyclic data flow is not always efficient. And one case when it's not efficient is if you have an application that needs to repeatedly reuse data or generally share data across a set of operations. So one example of this is iterative algorithms. And in, in many of these algorithms, you're applying essentially a similar function to the same data set. And being able to reuse that efficiently is, is hugely important for performance. Another example that motivated Spark is actually interactive data mining. So as soon as you put a big data set together, and even say when you're training your classifier, um, you may want to, to ask questions about the data interactively. And here you'd really like to be able to load a subset of the data and then query it at interactive speeds. Um, but with current frameworks, both of these applications incur a lot of overhead because they have to go and, and read the data from a stable storage system on each step and then write it back out to send it to the next step. And in a lot of these applications, you've measured more than 90% of your time might be spent um, in doing this I.O. and deserialization and all the stuff associated with sticking the data into a storage system. And so you scale out to this big cluster. It looks good. You're getting linear scaling. But your algorithm is still 10 times slower than it could be given your hardware. So here's just uh, some, some graphical um, representations of some of these applications. So with iterative applications, you can have sort of two cases. One case is you have the same data set, and you just apply many functions on it and, and you know, get back some results. The other thing you might do is you might also transform the data set and, and share the intermediate one. So this is the kind of thing you might get if you're doing a particle filter or something like that. And in Spark, our goal to, to make these efficient, our goal is to let you keep these working sets in RAM instead of going to the stable storage system. Um, so the idea is you, know, if you, you can load your data set into memory, distribute it across the cluster, uh, even if it's bigger than any single machine can hold, and then you can process it very quickly. RAM is you know, um, at least a factor of 10, maybe 100 times faster than most disk-based storage systems. And you can do the same in the one at the bottom. Um, so f from a systems point of view, what, what the systems research was about here is how, how do we design a, an actual programming abstraction that makes this both fault tolerant and efficient? Um, so we wanted to, to let you work with distributed memory without worrying about fault tolerance yourself so that this can work at scale in the largest clusters. And we also wanted it to be efficient. So how do you get both of them? Um, so the traditional way that people have worked with distributed memory, um, e either in things like distributed shared memory, um, or if you use, say, a database or memcached or a key value store, um, th these are systems that basically give you a fine-grained interface to access each record of the memory. So say each cell 
in a table. Um, and even though this is, you know, this is a, a nice, very generic interface, um, it's very hard to do fault tolerance efficiently for them because the only thing you can really do is either replicate the data across machines um, or log the updates across machines. You know, every time someone writes to one machine, it sends a copy of that update to someone else. And when you're working with big data, th these are both expensive. These require shipping the data over the network, which is about two orders mag of magnitude slower than the memory on your machines. So how do we solve this? The programming model we came up with um, is, is, based, is called um, Resilient Distributed Data Sets, or RDDs, and it's based instead on coarse-grained operations. So instead of going and accessing each cell of the memory, you do an operation to a whole data set at once, something like a map or a group by or a filter or a join. And what this allows us to do for fault tolerance is to recover by recomputing things. So um, we, we, this, we call this lineage. So we track the sequence of operations that you use to build each data set. And then if we lose a slice of that data set, we need to apply that operation on only a subset of the data to get that slice back. And um, if nothing fails, then of course there's, there's essentially no cost. All we're doing here is logging one operation to apply to many items. So here's what it looks like. Um, so f first of all, in the one at the bottom, imagine for example that we lost this whole output data set there. Um, then Spark will know to redo um, this iteration down, uh, down here and get um, the data set back. Um, if we lose both of these, um, it will know to redo both of these operations. Um, and then the more common case is that only one machine in your cluster fails and you lose a small piece of your data set. And in that case, Spark will read and rebuild only that piece. So it doesn't need to go back, doesn't need to hold back to a checkpoint. Uh, and in fact, you can often do the recovery in parallel on multiple machines. So, so this is you know, a high level overview of the model. Um, what is it good for? So even though we've restricted the model to these coarse-grained operations, what we found is that it's actually applicable to a lot of parallel algorithms, um, including a lot of machine learning algorithms, but other things as well. And this is because a lot of data parallel algorithms apply the same operation to multiple items anyway. So that's why the lineage-based fault tolerance strategy makes sense. And one of the cool things we've done is we've showed that using RDDs, we can efficiently express a lot of um, programming models that people have so far expressed as uh, built separate systems for. Um, so we can do the kinds of things that MapReduce and Dryad can do, but we can also build some of the things that uh, people have designed for certain kinds of iterative applications. Um, so for example, Google has a graph processing system called Pregel, and we can express that using RDDs. Uh, a bunch of folks have built iterative MapReduce. Um, there's also this bulk incremental work, which is um, incremental sort of stream processing. And we can also do some new applications that these models don't. So it's actually a pretty general programming model. So in the rest of the talk, I'm, I'm going to get a little more concrete and show you what programs with RDDs actually look like um, and um, give you some examples. And I'll also talk about some of the applications that people have built using Spark. Um, then I'll talk very little about the implementation just to tell you, you know, how, how easy this is to use. Um, and assuming that the internet works and stuff, I also want to, uh, to try to do a demo. So let's go into this. Um, so the programming interface. So one of the, the cool things we've done in Spark to make it really easy to write programs is that we've, we've built the API inside the Scala language. Scala is a, is a, a functional and object-oriented language for the JVM. It looks a lot like Java. Um, and um, what this lets you do is, is run operations like map and, and reduce and just write the functions right there um, as if you were doing functional programming locally. So it's a very concise interface. And in, in the API, you basically get three things. So you get RDDs. These look a lot like collections in Scala, except that they're distributed across the cluster. And the other thing they provide is you can tell uh, Spark which of the RDDs to keep in memory. We call that caching. Um, you get operations on RDDs. Uh, there's transformations, which build a new RDD. And there's actions, which, which compute a result and give it back. And then you get some um, special things that look like shared variables. They're not fully general shared variables, but they're useful for some tasks. So I'll talk about those more later. So first, let's show just the RDD stuff. Um, so here's an example of something you might do interactively, actually. All this stuff, by the way, is usable interactively from the Scala console, too. Um, so th this is just going to show some of the operations. 
Um, so here, you know, imagine you're, you're running a, a big web um, site and something is going wrong and you have these terabytes of logs being written. We're going to load just the logs into memory and then search for different patterns in them. So we have a cluster here. We have one master node, the driver, and a number of workers. And we're going to start by typing this. Um, so this here is defining an RDD, which is a, a file in the Hadoop file system. And this is a collection of strings. Next thing we, we want to do is to filter out the ones that, that contain errors. So that's the code for this. So filter is one of the transformations, and the code in red there is Scala syntax for a closure or a lambda function. So you can really have any Scala or Java code in there. Um, it's, it's not um, just string processing things. Okay, and this gives us back a new RDD representing just the error lines. Um, we can do more transformations too. For example, uh, maybe they're tab separated fields and we pull out only field number two. So that, that might be the actual message in the, in the record. And then we tell the system to cache these messages. Um, so, so that just the messages will be in memory. Okay, so uh, up, to, sorry, up to this point, nothing's happened on the cluster yet. So all these operations are lazy until you do an action. And that's what we're gonna do next, um, which is we're going to count how many of them contain foo. Um, and so, so this is an action. So now Spark has to actually run something to give you back a number. And it will basically come up with a, with a query plan based on the transformations you did so far and run it. Um, so first thing it does is it looks at where the data is distributed in HDFS, and then it sends tasks to the machines to process each of the blocks. And each block, you know, gives you back the, the, the count of, of errors for that one. Um, and it also saves in, in the cache um, the actual messages, so, so the partitions of, of the cached RDD, uh, so that you have them for later. So next time, if you do another query on this data set, um, let's say bar is, is now the thing we're searching for, um, Spark will know where these are cached and it will schedule based on the cache placement and you'll just hit those and return back much faster. And of course, you're not just limited to doing filters and, and maps, you can do group buys, joins, all kinds of other operations. Um, so to give you a, a sense of the speed of this, uh, one of the tests we did is a full text search of Wikipedia. This is a 50 gigabyte data set on 20 machines. And it takes about 20 seconds with Hadoop or with Spark with the on-disk data. And it takes less than one second with a cache data set. So this is really, this is the, the difference you get between memory and uh, disk performance. And if you want to leverage the full computational uh, capability of your cluster, this is what you have to, to reach. And we've, we've scaled this up um, just for fun as well. So we've scaled up to one terabyte of data on 100 machines, and there we can still do a full text search in about five seconds. Okay. Um, so the other thing I wanted to show here is the, the way this lineage stuff works. Um, so a, as I mentioned before, um, we, we recover from failures by recomputing just the missing data. And the way we do that is by building these lineage graphs. So when you do tra transformations here like filter and map, Spark ha has built this graph of how to derive the, the output RDD. And if it loses a partition, like if we lose, say, this one over here, um, then it knows that it just has to find this block, say, on a different machine, and run your map and filter, and rebuild it. And you can recover much, much faster than restarting the whole job. Okay, so let's, let's also show some, some machine learning applications now. Um, so this is, this is the simplest one, and it's, it's probably too simplified for a NIPS audience, but it still, I think, gives you a sense of how you would do other things. Um, so this one, we're just gonna do logistic regression, and we'll do it using a gradient descent. So the idea here is you have these labeled points, and you want to find a good separating hyperplane. And you can start with a random hyperplane, and then you can um, compute the gradient to it, so this is a parallel sum, something you can do with map and reduce. And then you can move the line in the direction of the gradient by a little bit. And of course, you, you keep doing that. And uh, eventually, you get to a pretty good uh, solution. So here's how to write that in Spark. And this is, again, this is actual Scala code that you could type in. Um, so there's two pieces. First, at the top, we, um, we load uh, the file. Maybe the points are in a text file. We pass them through this function to turn them into point objects, and we cache those. And that's because we're going to be using the points in every iteration, so we want to keep them around. Um, and then we start with a random parameter, w, and we do this map and, and reduce to compute the parallel sum. 
Um, and that's, that's essentially it. Uh, this is a batch gradient descent. You can also do uh, stochastic gradient descent. There's a version of map that lets you see multiple elements at once uh, for each partition of the data set. But th it, it will look very similar to this. So how does it actually perform? This is, again, a test we ran. This is on about 20 um, EC2 machines. And we compared logistic regression in Hadoop against Spark. So what we see with Hadoop is that it has the same cost for each iteration, about two minutes. And that's because it's doing the exact same thing. It's loading the data from the file system. Uh, it's deserializing it. And then it's doing the math for logistic regression. When we use Spark, the first iteration took a little longer, but further iterations are just six seconds. And uh, so it's, it's about 20 times faster. And of course, the more iterations you have, the more this matters. Um, so the reason for this, th there's actually a number of reasons. We did some profiling of this. So part of it is definitely the disk versus memory. But another big part is actually just parsing the data, just communicating with the distributed storage system, and then deserializing the data. And it's it, it's because in this logistic regression algorithm, the amount of computation per byte is very small. It's just a dot product. Um, and so all these costs of just talking to another system, getting the data back and converting it to your format actually dominate. It's 90, um, I, I guess about 95% of the time here is in Hadoop is spent doing that. It's not spent doing your math that you wrote down. OK. All right. So as one last example, I wanted to show something that's less data intensive and more compute intensive. Um, and that's going to be collaborative filtering. Uh, this is, again, a little simplified. Um, so this is you know, kind of Netflix challenge kind of thing. We have partial information about how users rated some movies. And we want to predict the other ratings. And um, the way we can do this is we can model um, the ratings matrix as a product of these um, smaller um, rank matrices, um, A and B. And we're going to do alternating least squares. So we're going to start with random A and B. And then we're going to optimize A by, by um, keeping B constant and doing um, at least squares. And then we're going to optimize B by switching it around and just, just do this until we converge. So here's how you write this just in normal Scala without Spark. Um, so what you can have, you can read your ratings matrix. You can have um, A and B starting out as just random uh, columns of, of the matrix. And then the syntax at the bottom, we're just going to take the indices 0 up to U. And for each index I, we're going to um, update that user. So, so that will give us a new value of A. And then we'll do the same thing for B. So this update user will be your least squares or whatever you want to do to update this particular user. Um, here's the simplest way to write it in Spark. Th there's a problem with this, but, but this is essentially what you do. Um, so here, um, we, we're using this operation parallelize, which is taking this Scala collection 0 until u and turning it into an RDD, so that different nodes will work on different slices of, of the range. Um, and then we can do our map and uh, collect at the end is to take back. Now we've computed all of the columns of A, but they're distributed across the cluster. So collect brings them back into an array that we can work with. And you can do the same thing for B. So this, you know, th this looks fine, and it will, it will run. Uh, there is one problem with it, and this is one of the features of Spark deals with it. Um, so that problem is that you have the, these closures and th these functions here involve R, which is the ratings matrix, which is a very big object. And by default, if you don't do anything special, um, Scala is going to package this, this R with each closure. And we're going to end up sending R to each node uh, multiple times, once on each iteration. Um, so, so we're basically going to spend a lot of time shipping around this, this sample data R. So what can we do to avoid that? Um, this is where one of the, the shared variables I mentioned comes in. So we have a feature called broadcast variables that lets you, if you have a large parameter vector, send it to each node um, only once. And the way you do that is you just wrap around R with spark.broadcast. And then here you, use, you have to call r.value to pull it out on that node. But this will make sure that it's sent only once. And it will use an efficient mechanism to distribute it to all the nodes. And in this job, um, this gave about a 3x uh, performance boost over the, the naive version. OK. Um, we, we actually, you know, being systems 
people, we, we did a lot of work to, to optimize this. So, so to us, this was one of the most interesting things we found as people started using Spark is they had these problems like large parameter vectors that uh, we, we didn't really anticipate. Uh, we were focusing more on just making things very parallel. So when we first started with this, we, uh, we did the broadcast by writing each file to HDFS. And Hadoop can do this too. There's a feature in Hadoop called the distributed cache that does this. And we quickly saw that as we scaled, this communication became the bottleneck. So um, this is, um, in, in this example, once we got past 60 nodes, we actually run slower because we spend more time broadcasting. Um, so we actually came up with a more efficient algorithm for broadcast in, in uh, commodity networks and data centers uh, called Cornet that has essentially the same cost uh, at, even at high scales. Um, and it's based on BitTorrent. It's, uh, it's, so the idea is all the nodes collaborate in sending blocks to each other, um, and it's optimized for data center topologies. Um, and we uh, have, um, if you're interested in this, we have a SIGCOM paper about this. Um, you can also see, um, so, so in this graph, we're just comparing it with other ways of doing uh, broadcast, including vanilla BitTorrent. Okay. So, so that's, uh, you know, th that was um, sort of about... Um, Spark itself and the programming model. Um, let me also talk a bit about applications we did using it. Um, so Spark is open source, and there are a number of people using it, both in Berkeley and outside, mostly at some startup companies in the Bay Area. Um, so some of the applications we've done at Berkeley, um, th these are applications that I should say machine learning researchers have done. I, I didn't uh, do them, but they're sort of real applications that are their research. Um, uh, one of them is a traffic um, estimation system for auto traffic called Mobile Millennium. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that because it's a cool application. Um, another one is a spam classification um, using stochastic gradient descent um, called Monarch. Um, and another, uh, the company that uses Spark most heavily is Conviva, uh, which does video distribution and they do analytics and anomaly detection using Spark. And we've done a bunch of other things as well. Um, so let me just give you an, an overview of this one because it's, it's kind of a cool application. Um, so Mobile Millennium is, is a project um, in the civil engineering department at Berkeley. Um, and um, the idea is that they want to estimate uh, traffic conditions in the city very accurately um, without having to install sensors there, just by using GPS data from some vehicles that have uh, GPS on them. And initially, you know, they wanted to use people's mobile phones. They also found out a good way to do this is to just set up a deal with, say, a taxi cab company. So you get these data, they get samples every minute, and what the data look like is, a, you know, you get a position for each taxi cab every minute. Um, and you can immediately see this is it's not super easy to do inference based on this because the taxi cab might have moved several blocks in that time. And so what, what they're trying to do is just by looking at how far it moved and how long it took to estimate the traffic condition on each link of road in, in the city. Um, so this is just what some, some of the data looks like for this. Um, this is from San Francisco. Um, and there's, there's a cab company in San Francisco that they work with. Um, and um, so each day they get about 500,000 data points. Um, and um, you know the points are just showing these cars moving. So you can see it's kind of cool. You see more data on the roads where people travel more. But then that's probably OK, because those are the ones that have traffic problems. And I don't know if you can see it, but in the downtown area, there's also a lot of noise because there are a lot of tall buildings. Um, so this is, this is what they have to work with. OK. So, so basically, the challenge is you have this data that is noisy, and it's, actually, it's pretty sparse, one sample per minute. And in addition to, to, know, to predicting the travel times, you have to predict the paths taken. So in this example, you know, first, you may not be sure exactly where that GPS reading came from, because it's not in the middle of, of the block there. Um, and then you know, the car might have taken this path, or it might have taken this path. Um, and in, in any case, whatever it took, the output you want is something like this, where for each link in the network, you get a, a distribution, actually, of travel times on that link, because so, the travel time isn't constant. And they, they actually have a fairly complex distribution that, that they use based on actually analyzing how, how hill traffic works. OK. So how do they do this? Um, they use the EM algorithm uh, to estimate both of these unknowns simultaneously. Um, so if you knew the path of each car, it would be 
possible to estimate the, the travel time, or it would be easier at least, if you knew how long it's spent on each link. And if you knew the travel time distributions for each link, you could infer which links the, the car took based on how, where it moved in that one minute. Um, so they, they use essentially important sampling. Um, for each pair of points, they generate some, some possible paths it might have taken and times along the links of the path, and they weigh them based on the current parameters that they have for the links, and then they update the parameters and repeat. So these are the, the ENM steps, the, the two steps shown here. And both of these things can be done in Spark using some of the operations we have. So uh, the first one is a map. Flat map is a map that can output multiple elements for each input. Um, the second one is a, is a distributed group by or distributed reduce. And for the parameters, it's actually a pretty big vector. So they ended up using broadcast. Um, and the code for this, the core loop of the code is, is actually about 20 lines of code. Most of the code outside of that is dealing with the specific distributions they have um, for, for their traffic models. Okay, um, so, so yeah, so um, here are some, some results showing how this scales. Uh, this is running on a cluster um, at NERSC, uh, which is, you know, Department of Energy um, Computing Center, and they're scaling um, from, um, I think, four machines up to 160 machines, each with four cores. And um, here they have es essentially almost linear scalability, um, and it's because the, the algorithm is actually mainly CPU bound. Uh, so it's, it's relatively easy to scale to, to more nodes. Um, we do, however, have a speed up from using Spark features. So by using caching, they gained a factor of three speed up over the initial version. And by using broadcast, they could disseminate the, the initial data and the parameter uh, about four times faster. So this is, the, and there's a paper on this at the Symposium on Cloud Computing this year that says the details of what we did. Okay. So, so that's, that's this application. Um, the other thing I want to talk about in the applications is um, the, this thing I talked about initially about how IDDs are a pretty general computing model. model. So why does that matter? Um, so so um, you know, one, one reason is that um, it's just interesting to find a model that's sort of more fundamental and, and not specific to one type of problem. But the other reason is that because we can support these, these other interfaces on top of RDDs, we can let programmers efficiently intermix these in the same program. So you can imagine you can have a program where you, uh, you do a map and reduce or a SQL query to load um, some kind of graph into memory, then you do some specialized graph processing operation, and then you do some machine learning operation on the result of that. And with Spark, you can actually keep the data and memory across all of these and have fault recovery across all of them, um, and so on. Um, so just some of the models we support. Um, map, reduce, and dryad, I think you, you've seen from the operations we have that you can do map and reduce and group by and so on. Um, uh, one interesting one here is Spragel. Uh, this is a graph processing model from Google that initially looks very different from map reduce. It's based on passing messages between the nodes. But it turns out that you can implement it using RDDs, and you can also crucially implement all the placement optimizations that Google did. So things like keeping the graph partitioned in a specific way uh, so that you minimize communication. You can use uh, RDDs give you control over partitioning, so you can do that. Um, and there's, there's other models that we have done as well. Um, some specific ones that we've built, we've implemented Pagel as a library in about 200 lines of code. Um, it's called Bagel for Berkeley Pagel. Um, we've built Haloop also. This was uh, iterative map readers, just as a proof of concept. And a more sort of um, uh, extensive one that we're working on now is Hive. Hive is a SQL uh, interface on top of Hadoop, and Hive on Spark is called Shark. And so this will give you the ability, it'll be compatible with Apache Hive, so you'll be able to do SQL on big data. And we're going to add machine learning specific functions into it. So you can also do um, different operations like say k-means um, from the command line interactively. Okay, and finally let me talk a little bit about the implementation and then see if I can actually show you guys this thing in action. Um, so um, Spark is implemented on top of another system we, we built in the lab called Mesos, which is a cluster manager that can essentially um, efficiently share the cluster among multiple users and multiple different programming frameworks. So using Mesos, you can run Spark on a cluster, have it coexist with Hadoop or with MPI 
or other kinds of applications and share resources dynamically between them. Um, Spark is implemented from scratch. It's not a modified version of Hadoop or something like that, but it can reuse any input um, uh, source and any serialization format that Hadoop does because it uses the same APIs that Hadoop does to talk to these systems. So you get all of that essentially for, for free to, to be able to use your existing Hadoop data. And even though we, we built in Scala, we didn't actually have to change Scala itself for the compiler. Um, it turns out the way it compiles the closures is, is sort of good enough um, that we can use that um, to, to run in parallel. So, so this is great because we don't want to be su supporting some kind of weird version of Scala that, that's not standard. Okay, and that is, that is the one slide on implementation. Um, you can ask you know, for more details after. So yeah, so, so last thing I'd like to do is uh, try to do a, a demo of this and we'll see um, if the uh, internet works for me. But hopefully it'll be okay. So let's join this guy. No, it didn't. Huh. Oh, you did? What's it? Yeah. Okay. This one? Ah. Okay, let's just see whether this works. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Let's see if this will actually work. Um, seems to be. Do you think it would be possible to fix, or should I? Um, oh. Oh, I see. So it, maybe I'll wait a little bit, maybe if, if there are questions. Otherwise, I have a video of this too, so I could do that. But it's, it's cooler seeing it live, I think. Um, yeah? Yeah? You think so? Okay. So, okay, l let me just do that one then. Um, so you'll have to trust me that this is not a fake thing. And hopefully this will actually work. Um, so this is so this is the the demo with um, with Wikipedia I was mentioning, um, and so um, here I launched a cluster on EC2 with 20 nodes and this 50 gigabyte Wikipedia dataset, um, and so this is the Spark interpreter, and you can type stuff into it that's standard Scala stuff, and you also get this variable called Spark context that is um, your um, your way to to do stuff in parallel. So the first thing we did here no stop oh man okay. This is going faster than I, I can talk. So first thing we did there at the top file is we, we referenced this file in the Hadoop distributed file system, which is Wikipedia. It's a tab separated values uh, file. Um, and so this gives us back an, an RDD containing strings. Okay. And then next thing we did file that first, this is just to peek at the first line in the file. And we just get that right away. It just opens that line of the file. Um, and so you can see this is a tab separated format and there are sort of five fields for each um, page on Wikipedia. There's an ID, article ID, there's a title, I guess this was alphabetically first. Um, there's a date last modified, there's an XML version and you don't see it but there's a fifth field that's a plain text version of the article. Okay, so let's go on from here. Come on. Why isn't it hiding it? Oh, let's let it hide it. Um, okay, so, so here we're going to, to define a class to represent these articles, and we're only going to work with two of the fields, the title and the text. So this is how you de define a class in Scala. Um, and next we're going to actually compute these article objects. So we're going to use a map. We'll split each line by tabs. Um, we'll filter, we'll pick the ones that have exactly five fields because some of them don't have the last field, the plain text, because they're things like images. And then we'll build a new article from each one. Okay. And now we're going to search, so we haven't asked the system to cache this yet, so it's still in, on disk. And we're going to search how many contain the RadLab. RadLab was the previous lab before the AMP lab, so it was reliable, adaptive, distributed systems. And you can take a guess how many Wikipedia articles mention RadLab. Um, so while you're taking the guess, this is running, or this has run stuff um, on the cluster, um, and now it's, it's finishing up all these tasks. And okay, the answer is one. So there's one Wikipedia article that, that mentioned the lab. Okay, 
Next thing we're going to do is let's try this with a cache data set. Um, so let, let's first, we, we call articles.cache and we'll call filter on it. Now since the data isn't in memory yet, the first time we have to load it again. So it takes about the same amount of time, which is hopefully about 20 seconds. That's, that's how long it took. Um, okay. And you know, it's, it's running all this stuff. And yeah, it took about 20 seconds, and the answer is still one. And if we try it again, it took about one and a half seconds. So this is, again, this is the difference between being in memory. And the last thing we're going to do here is let's see what, what's the title of that article that contains RadLab. And when we run that, we can see, okay, it's the article on Dave Patterson. So yeah, so I think that's all there was for this. Unless, oh, wait. Oh, actually, no, let's, let's see this part, too. Because, so this is kind of important, actually. So now, now we're going to count how many articles contain Berkeley. Uh, because we're very narcissistic at Berkeley. We just search for ourselves in, in these things. <laughs> That's what the lab is about. So about 11, 12,000 using Berkeley. And next, let's see Stanford. OK. Oh, and only 10,000. OK, so there we go. So this, this is one of the main takeaways from the talk. Um, OK. Yeah, so, um, so just to th finish off, thanks for listening. So we, have, we think IDDs are a pretty powerful and efficient programming model. We also think they're a cool tool to, to build high-level abstractions on so that you don't have to worry about the low-level fault tolerance stuff. And this stuff is open source. It has a growing open source community, and we invite you to check it out. Okay. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, so, so we actually don't have checkpoints. What happens in there, the data we had in memory was the points. So the, we, we took these uh, lines of text and we did a map function to turn them into vectors. And if you lose a node, all the blocks that that node had in its cache are now no longer in memory anymore. So we, we have different nodes we compute them in parallel, starting with the data in the, in the st stable storage system. You know, which is not So what happens is, you know, when you know dies that maybe you lost 10 blocks or 100 blocks, the other nodes start to be computing those, and now you have those back in memory. Well, what the, the parameter vector is it's, it's both Oh, yes. Yeah. The... yeah, so the parameter vector, you, the nodes will get the task again with, with that one. So even, so even when you do the Victor and broadcast, it's set up in a way where a node can come later and say, hey, I don't have it, and still get it from this. Yeah. The, the thing we don't provide for tolerance for is if your master program crashes, the one where you had your folder, if you want to, to do that, you, you can implement some checkpointing yourself. But we don't try to do that automatically because that has a lot of state. That's hard to do. More questions? Yeah, maybe. <coughs> can you tell us a bit more about the joint uh, shuffle operation for the group by joint? How is it implemented and how it compares to Hadoop and if it hits the list or it's just Yeah, so so I shuffle this because right now um, it's mostly in memory. Um, what happens is I can do the, the map is the, the map side of the shuffle writes some some files to the file system and then the reduce side fetches them. But those files usually stay in the OS buffer cache by the time you fetch them. So if, if your shuffle is too big to fit in memory, then it will sort of automatically spill onto disk. And we haven't done anything super smart with, with um, on disk sorting on, on the reduce side. We're thinking to do that next. But if it fits in memory, then you're okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you talk about a cluster right here, meshes? Yes. Okay. Uh, is that something you focus on? Is that so? Is this a project it's open source or? Yeah, it's open source. It's also a research project from our lab, and it's actually an Apache incubator project. Right? So it is open source. Yeah. 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 Uh, do you have a primitive uh, building block for all reduce uh, for aggregating stuff in parallel? For aggregating. And broadcasting the results. Oh, I see. Um, right now we don't, but that would be that would be uh, interesting. To add. I, I don't think it would be too bad. I think to, to do that really nicely, you would want to combine the, the stuff we did for broadcast with the sort of standard reviews. Yeah. What would we 
try and catch more data than we get into the bedrock? Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So one of the cool things about the, the bulk operations in Spark is that um, if you need to spin up the disk, they're still pretty efficient because they're sequential scans. So what will happen is Spark will keep only a part of the data in memory, and you should get a speed up that's you know in between what you would have gotten with the full memory. And uh, um, I may have a map of that, but yeah. So this is uh, so you know so so you, you can still get some speed up. Oh, you mean as examples for people? So we have some simple examples. We have logistic regression, cadence, um, and we have beta, which I guess is you know, maybe useful for some things. Uh, and we have alternating these squares. Um, we don't have more complex ones yet, but yeah, we're, we're very interested in building up a library of them that other folks can use. Thank you.